Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Make sure you stay connected, let us know what you like, and support us on Patreon so we can keep bringing you great lessons on rocket science. Over the last few lessons, we reviewed the performance of the SpaceX Integrated Flight Test 2 and ran some numbers on the evolution of the Raptor engine, as well as giving you a homework assignment. Here it is. Calculate the reduction in residence time from Raptor 1 to the Elite 1337. And here you can see the numbers that were given to us. Engine designation, thrust in tons of force, and specific impulse in seconds. As we know, having the specific impulse allows us to calculate ejection velocity, the speed of the exhaust coming out here. Why do we use specific impulse instead of ejection velocity? Because while ejection velocity is different between metric and imperial, specific impulse uses one metric, time, which is universal around the Earth. And there's less room for mistakes. We lost a good Mars lander because JPL was using feet per second and the European Space Agency was using meters per second. We get our exhaust velocity for all the rockets and we turn these thrust numbers into usable units, newtons. Now we get our mass propellant flow or M dot as before. Calculate our liquid oxygen and liquid methane ratios if you want to, using the oxidizer to fuel ratio of the Raptor engine. We could also calculate the volume per second pumped through the engine by knowing the density of these cryogenic propellants. As you can see here, the volume pumped through a Raptor version 3.3 is much higher than a Raptor 1 but that's not necessary to calculate the improvement in residence time. Now, to calculate the exact residence time, we would need to know the exact volume of a SpaceX Raptor engine combustion chamber, something that I could not find. Thermodynamic equations tell me it should be between 2 and 4 cubic meters, but that's not accurate enough. I thought about trying to estimate it, going off diagrams or pictures, or perhaps going with 1.5 Elon noggins wide, by too long, but that didn't seem accurate, and we couldn't find a sufficiently stripped down engine to use as a reference anyway. Plus, what's the volume of Elon's head? Who knows? And is it variable? But I ask about the reduction in residence time, not the actual residence time itself. By setting the mass propellant flow to a standard of 1 in the Raptor 1, and then using it as a metric to compare the other engines, we get this. The Raptor 2 is pumping 1.255 times more propellant mass per second, and so on. We can also divide our standard by the new performance metric of each engine and get a relative fractional time. Whatever the exact residence time is for Raptor 1, the Raptor 2 can pump the same amount of propellant in 0.797 of that time, which is an improvement of 0.203. And if we turn those into percentages, so they are more intuitive, we see that the Raptor 2 has a residence time 20% less than that of Raptor 1. Working this out for all the other engines shows that by the time we get to Raptor version 3.3, our engines are pumping propellant more than one and a half times as fast, and with a 39% reduction in residence time. By the way, some of you dared to suggest that I had gotten something wrong on the last lesson. Let's look and see if they are right. We were talking about using a single Raptor engine for a rocket, using the maximum thrust of the Raptor 1 to calculate the maximum mass of the rocket, assuming a thrust to weight ratio of 1.5. With a thrust of 185 tons, we got a mass of 123 tons. Then I pointed out that on the moon, gravity is not 9.8 meters per second squared, but only 1.62, dramatically dropping the weight of the rocket and changing our thrust to weight ratio from 1.5 to 9. And I quickly assumed that this meant the astronauts would suffer 9 g's of acceleration. Well, I blew that one. We know that force equals mass times acceleration, and since we have the force and the mass, we can calculate the acceleration. If this rocket were in empty space, we see that it would accelerate at 15 meters per second squared. Huh? It was at this moment that he knew. He f***ed up. Oh my God. Oh. <laughs> and I immediately know that I was wrong on the G-forces. 
because this is not even two G's. Now we burn over half a ton of propellant per second. Our mass will drop and our acceleration will increase, but that doesn't save me. Because if we look at the starting acceleration and account for gravity drag, we see that our acceleration is about 13 meters per second squared on the moon and 4.9 meters per second squared on the Earth. That has us feeling about 1.3 g's on the moon and half a g on Earth, compared to what we always feel living here on Earth. Thank you to those who pointed out that error. Now let's do something else fun. Here you see the Raptor 2 engines on the Starship booster. In IFT-1, we saw three engines fail at startup. Let's look at the effect this would have had. These engines put out a maximum of 230 tons of force if they are operating at the usual 70% maximum operating thrust to allow a safety margin, we would get 161 tons of force per engine. With 33 engines, that would give us a total thrust at launch of 5,300 tons. Now if the dry mass of the booster is 180 tons, with a propellant mass of 3,400 tons, and that of the Starship is 120 tons, plus its 1,200 tons of propellant, the total would be 4,900 tons. Now we would get a thrust to weight ratio of just 1.084. If we subtract 1 g for the gravity drag, we get an actual acceleration of only 0 0.83 meters per second. Ah, you thought I did it again, didn't you? Confusing thrust to weight with g's. But on Earth, it works out the same. It's only under a different gravitational field like the moon that I get messed up. But let's double check. Force equals mass times acceleration, so acceleration equals force over mass. If we turn the thrust into newtons by multiplying by 1,000 and 9.81 and divide that by the mass converted to kilograms, we should get the acceleration, 10.64 meters per second squared. We subtract the gravity drag of 9.81 meters per second squared from the Earth and end up with the same number allowing for rounding errors. That seems much too slow. SpaceX does not give us an accelerometer reading, which I really wish they would, because it is not possible to judge the first meter of climb if we watch these rockets launch. For one thing, IFT-1 gets buried in dust and debris. And then IFT-2 changes its camera angle too much and freezes, since they're using X instead of YouTube for their broadcasts. But if we just go off telemetry and start counting from when the speed starts to change, we can make some calculations. Here we see the speed jump to 1 kilometer per hour. There are 1,000 meters per kilometer and 3,600 seconds in an hour. So this comes out to a change in velocity of 0.3 meters per second. Then it drops back to zero. I think this was probably a vibration-related sensor error. We pass one second still at zero kilometers per hour, and we hit two seconds and are back up to a change of 0 0.3 meters per second. Which, if that occurred over one second's time, would be a change in velocity of 0 to 0 0.3 meters per second over 1 second, so 0.3 meters per second squared. Now, if that were the real acceleration, we could add back gravity drag and get 10.1 meters per second squared. Multiply that by the mass we had earlier and calculate the force. That comes out to 49,430,111 newtons, or 5,039 tons force if we want to look at it that way. This would be a thrust-to-weight ratio of 1.03, a little anemic, I think. Now, the purpose of this exercise is to show you how to make these calculations. Don't get lost in worrying if the telemetry data is accurate. Now, between 2 and 3 seconds, we go from 1 to 11 kilometers per hour, so a change of 10 kilometers per hour, which is 3 meters per second over 1 second, so 3 meters per second squared. We add back in gravity drag and get 12.8 meters per second squared. Then we multiply that by the mass and get a thrust of 61,680,111 newtons, which comes out to 6,287 tons of force. We are three seconds in, so we've burned about 60 tons of propellant. Let's subtract that from our starting mass of 4,900,000 kilograms and get 4,840,000 kilograms for our new mass at this point. Accounting for this reduction in mass is important to remember. We practiced calculating mass propellant flow in the last lesson. So assuming a 70% throttle, we would get a loss of over 16 tons per second total for all 33 engines. This causes a constantly increasing acceleration as the ship gets lighter. 
but I would wager that these engines are above 70% throttle on launch. SpaceX, after all, wants to field test their rockets under tough conditions. At 85% throttle, they would go through the estimated 20 metric tons per second I mentioned earlier. With that in mind, they can start throttling back the power as the rocket loses mass. Now over the next 7 seconds, we go from 11 kilometers per hour to 112 kilometers per hour for a difference of 101 kilometers per hour, which is 101,000 meters per hour. We call this delta V or change in velocity. Now we need delta T or change in time. From 3 to 10 seconds gives us a change in time of 7 seconds, which multiplied by 3600 seconds per hour gives us a delta T of 25,200 seconds. Delta V over delta T gives us an acceleration of 4 meters per second squared. Add back our gravity drag and we get 13.8 meters per second squared. Now we take our mass of 4,840,000 kilograms and subtract another 140 metric tons or 140,000 kilograms for the propellant burn and we get 4,700,000 kilograms. We multiply that by our current acceleration of 13.8 meters per second squared and get a thrust of 64,944,302 newtons, which works out to 6,620 tons of force. If we divide that by our current mass of 4,700 metric tons, we get a thrust to weight ratio of 1.41. This is looking better. If your brain hasn't exploded yet, let's look at one more thing. Here we see the booster engines. On the launch of Starship for IFT-1, we saw three engines fail to start. These three. To compensate for this, we can draw an imaginary line here. The moment arm total change from losing these engines must be corrected, or our rocket will go off course. The engines out here have more leverage than the engines closer in, so they place more torque on the ship. The N1 fixed this problem by shutting down the opposite engine. Imagine if SpaceX had used this algorithm, and these engines had been shut down at launch. Now we are out six engines, and even if your rocket had started to climb, it won't have time to rev up the rest before it starts to fall back. Thank goodness they had better software. SpaceX computers do some nice math to increase the thrust of these engines out here first, as that is the most fuel-efficient way to correct the problem. It may also turn the thrust out here down a little. Will it roll the ship so that the failed engines are on the pitch-over side? I don't know but it might not be a bad idea to think about. What do you think? Let us know and have a great holiday season. Ad Astra Proterra. Attention all operators on countdown one. This is the final go, no go for flight two of Starship. Again, our T zero is at 7 a.m. Central. Raptor one. Go. Raptor two. Go. Stage one. Go. Stage two. Go. Copy, go for flight. Clock is rolling. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. We have liftoff.